Welcome to Live Doctors, everyone. I'm your host, Andrew David Schiller, and uh, we're fortunate today to be with Dr. Robert Stein from the Cleveland Clinic in Cleveland, Ohio. Dr. Stein is an associate professor of urologic surgery and the co-director of the robotic surgery program. Uh, he's a world-renowned expert in robotic minimally invasive surgery, and we're here today talking about prostate cancer. Dr. Stein, welcome. Thanks for being with us. Thank you for having me. Sure. So maybe we could start by you telling our audience a little bit about prostate cancer and what it is. Okay. Prostate cancer is the most common cancer among men. And in America, one out of every six men eventually will develop prostate cancer. Uh, it's an extremely common cancer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I see. And now, common, does that mean it's very dangerous to most people or... How, how worried should people be when they hear about that? Um, yeah, prostate cancer can be very aggressive and it um, can have, uh, or can cause death, it can cause uh, metastatic disease or spread, uh, it can cause pain, especially bone pain. Mm -hmm. uh, so it is a, a made, it can be a major problem. Some of the nicer points of prostate cancer are that it can be slow growing mm -hmm. and we think that uh, that some of pro some prostate cancers are relatively the word we use is indolent uh -huh. or uh, grow so slowly that perhaps they won't affect the lifespan of the person that they'll have some other problem bef uh, far before uh, prostate cancer will take them right right it, it is it's one of the challenges with prostate cancer because uh, it is it is difficult to determine uh, which cancers we have to take care of and which cancers per perhaps we don't really need to treat and therefore um, won't give them a problem in the future. Okay, thanks very much. Um, so the next question would be, um, who tends to get prostate cancer? Are there particular groups of people in which it's more common? Are there groups of people in which more serious cancers are more common and less serious cancers are more common? Yes, so uh, in general, uh, all men can develop prostate cancer, but uh, especially African-American men, it, it is more common for them to develop prostate cancer, and actually they tend to have uh, more aggressive forms of mm. prostate cancer. Mm. So uh, we do uh, historically start screening earlier in African-American men, mm. yes. Mm. Is there anything about family history that people should know about in terms of if they've had a relative who's had prostate cancer, does that give them more risk or? Yes. Uh, the, uh, men who have had a first degree relative, uh, we use that term for a father or a brother uh, who have had prostate cancer before, we, we do start screening in them earlier as well because they do tend to develop uh, prostate cancer uh, more commonly. Mm. I'm wondering if you could tell our listeners and our viewers what kind of symptoms might someone have that would lead them to be concerned they should go get checked out? Would a person actually get symptoms of prostate cancer that they should worry about? Or is it more of something that gets screened based on just the age or the, the uh, demographic variables of the person? Yes, uh, prostate cancer can cause symptoms uh, such as difficulty with urinating, also uh, bone pain. Uh, but the problem is that these are usually uh, very late stages when the prostate cancer becomes uh, very aggressive and spreads or metastasizes. Uh -huh. The difficulty at that point is treating the prostate cancer. We, we have many medications and ways to put the cancer into remission as much as possible, but it's very difficult to cure the cancer at that point. Mm -hmm. uh, so the difficulty uh, is we need to find these cancers early mm -hmm. and the cancer at an earlier stage has no symptoms whatsoever. I see. Uh, this has led us to uh, start screening uh, um, routinely in men uh, and we've done that so far with the PSA test. It's a blood test and uh, hopefully if the PSA test is high then we know that that man is more likely to have prostate cancer and then we can start to uh, to, to check uh, with biopsies whether the man does have prostate cancer. So the key and I think um, 
I, I do see patients in, in, in the office who say, well, I, I don't have any symptoms, uh, but you know, you have to remind them or explain that, well, uh, when these cancers uh, are curable, it's early before you have symptoms. So, uh -huh. Very important yeah, point. Yeah, thank you. So Dr. Stein, we've been talking about prostate cancer and the importance of screening to actually detect it because symptoms are not a good way to know whether a person has prostate cancer. So when we're talking about screening, uh, tell us more about the different tests that are used for screening and can that distinguish between cancers that are aggressive versus ones that are less aggressive and less, less dangerous? And are there particular people who should get screened and at what age or what point in life should they get screened? Yes. Uh, so again, our typical uh, screening uh, test has been the PSA blood test. Uh, historically, we've been uh, starting that at the age of 50. Uh, more recently, over the last few years, there has been some controversy about whether screening is necessary, whether it is helpful, uh, but uh, the American Urological Association uh, which is our, our main urologic association in America, has uh, suggested that between the ages of 55 and 70, at the very least, uh, men should undergo go screening. Um, it, there is a, a reasonable thought that perhaps we should screen even a little bit earlier than the age of 55. Mm -hmm. uh, some, some suggest that maybe getting a baseline PSA test or a, sort of an, an initial test to kind of see if this gentleman or if a, if a person is more likely uh, to develop uh, cancer at a younger age, uh, maybe at the age of 40 or 45, instead of waiting uh, all the way till 50. To, to 55. Mm -hmm. But um, there is a significant amount of controversy about when exactly to start screening. I, I, I strongly think that uh, screening is uh, helpful. It, it's, it, it is, uh, I think, a, a very necessary thing mm -hmm. uh, to prevent uh, more aggressive cancers in our population. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And so the first test is the PSA, which is my understanding is the prostate-specific antigen. It's a protein that is produced by the prostate. And if I'm understanding correctly, it's more abundant in someone who has prostate cancer. So we get a higher level, is that right? Correct. Yeah. Um, yes, we, we, we do, if the PSA is too high, then that suggests that the, uh, that the man may have a higher likelihood of having prostate cancer. Mm -hmm. The <clears throat> problem with PSA is that the, it, it, is, it is not absolutely specific to prostate cancer. Mm -hmm. So uh, the prostate is the only organ that makes PSA, but if the prostate has some inflammation that's uh -huh. benign that, and there, there is actually no cancer, but, there's some, it, but the prostate is inflamed, it can give off too much PSA and therefore um, there are other situations or it may be a, a, an enlarged prostate, again, that doesn't have uh, prostate cancer. That also uh, can lead to a higher PSA mm -hmm. level in the bloodstream. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> the, we, we do need to follow up at a high PSA with a biopsy just uh -huh. to uh -huh. be sure that this uh, it is from cancer. Mm -hmm. um, there, there are other tests that are being developed and even have been developed already. Uh, there's one from a company called Opco called the 4K test. Uh, presently, uh, there's uh, one called PCA3, which is a urine test. Mm. And these, these are tests which have been uh, developed, which uh, seem to be a little bit more specific to prostate cancer, where there's not as many, we, we call it false positives, mm -hmm. where it's where where the test is abnormal due to some other problem besides prostate cancer. Mm -hmm. So I think that there is uh, excellent develop, development of newer tests in the future that are very exciting uh, and that will Im improve our ability to find cancers and not so much 
and, and decrease the, uh, the incidence of having biopsies which are unnecessary, which mm -hmm. are negative. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so there's a lot of development in this area right. Right. of better screening tests right. than PSA. Right. right, so it sounds like the benefit of getting better screening tests is there'll be less false positives and people will have to have less uh, biopsies and other testing. Uh, it's interesting, one of the things you mentioned was that an enlarged prostate can actually result in a high PSA. And if I understand correctly, that would be another case in which someone might have difficulty urinating. So you could have two men both with difficulty urinating and one could have just an enlarged prostate, which is a completely harmless pro problem. Or and then someone could have a prostate cancer. So making yes. that distinction is really what you're, it's all about, it sounds like. Yeah, ab absolutely. Yeah. We, yeah. we just we can't tell just clinically, uh, yeah. just by asking patients mm. and discussing with them and examining them, yeah. we, we can't tell uh, with prostate cancer if, if they have prostate cancer. So we really need these additional tests, these uh, screening tests, uh, biopsies in order uh, to, to tell us whether they do or don't have cancer. Right. So now before you mentioned that there are aggressive prostate cancers and non-aggressive or indolent prostate cancers and you made mention this notion the way we understood it in medical school hopefully this is still true is that most people who have prostate cancer they don't die from the prostate cancer but they die with it eventually because at some point we all do. Do you, yes. do you agree with that statement still? Uh, to, to a certain extent, yeah. um, and we can, based on the biopsy results, we can tell uh, to some extent whether this is, seems to be a, a more aggressive or a less aggressive cancer. So uh, there are many cancers that have uh, um, pathological findings, so essentially the way that, this, that, that the cancer cells look under the microscope, uh, we can tell that they don't look very aggressive. And we, we're becoming much better in those patients of saying to the, uh, or for those patients uh, of, of saying to them, well, <clears throat> maybe we don't need to treat this. Maybe we can just sort of watch it closely mm -hmm. and make sure that over time uh, we, that this doesn't develop into a more aggressive cancer. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, there are some other cancers uh, that based on how the cells look under the microscope, we can tell that these are very aggressive cancers mm -hmm. and, uh, and probably have a high likelihood of uh, eventually spreading or metastasizing. Uh, prostate cancer can spread to the lymph nodes or to the bones. Mm. It can cause uh, severe pain. Uh, it can cause problems with also just locally urination. And, um, and it, it, can, it certainly can cause death. And uh, <clears throat> it was, uh, the, the rate of death from prostate cancer uh, was relatively high and, uh, and um, before we had good PSA screening tests was certainly the, um, the, 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 um, the, the uh, did have the highest death rate among cancers uh, or, or did have the highest death rate of any cancer mortality rate we call it. Biopsies are very common uh, that we, we can do them just in the office uh, just with local anesthesia so we don't have to put people to sleep we don't have to put people under sedation uh, it's it's quite a minor procedure very comfortable uh, so the um, the concern about the biopsy is, is, is um, doesn't need to be too over uh, emphasized, I think. Yeah. So in other words, if somebody has an elevated PSA and there's some risk, it's really a good idea to get the biopsy and then they can know whether this is just a benign lesion that needs to be watched gradually over the years or if it's something that needs more serious treatment. Correct. Uh, so, so the biopsy procedure uh, it is very critical for us to understand is this a dangerous prostate cancer or is this a less dangerous prostate cancer and from there we decide everything else in terms of treatment or no treatment or, or close follow-up which is called surveillance. Uh, there are uh, very rare uh, complications with biopsy like infection, like difficulties with urinary 
fascinating. Mm -hmm. uh, but thankfully, and uh, due to uh, different things that we do, including giving certain antibiotics, mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> these, these issues and uh, complications are pretty rare. Okay, it's good to know. Thank you. So, Dr. Stein, I was noticing that you were also involved in developing MRI techniques for diagnosing prostate cancer. Could you say something about what the importance of that is and what extra information that provides beyond the biopsy? Yes. A MRI uh, it had, is a relatively new technology where we can actually, for the first time, uh, see uh, cancers and especially more aggressive cancers uh, better so we can to some extent understand exactly where these tumors are and then do targeted biopsies we can using a computer we can find uh, and and biopsy and uh, and locate the exact tumor mm -hmm. uh, also uh, it, it's it's possible better more possible with this technology that eventually hopefully we'll be able to just uh, burn or freeze uh, the, the tumor and do what we call focal therapy where we don't have to remove the whole prostate and we don't have to radiate the whole prostate. So Interesting. MRI is yeah. one of the more uh, exciting areas yeah. that's developed. So if I understand that correctly, what you're saying is that the MRI lets you get a more clear picture of exactly the shape of the abnormal cells or the area that seems like it's abnormal and from the shape of it you can get a clearer um, direction about how to either biopsy it or how to treat it or even how aggressive it is based on the shape of the the, the growth that's there. Yes, uh, I, that is true and it's really revolutionized wow. uh, over the last three or four years uh, how, we, how we manage and uh, diagnose prostate cancer. Great, okay. Is there anything else that you'd like to say, Dr. Stein, about diagnosing prostate cancer? We've covered a lot of the issues of the PSA, which is that serum protein and then other tests that are also blood tests and then the MRI scanning and the biopsy. Uh, is there anything else about diagnosis that our listeners would want to know? Yes, I, I think uh, another area that's uh, developing and, and which is very exciting is called genomics where we're actually being able to send uh, the prostate cancer tissue on, on the slides that we get from the biopsies uh, to a lab and they can tell us just based on the genetic information mm -hmm. from the cells uh, whether this is going to tend to be a more aggressive cancer, a, a, a less aggressive cancer. And based on this, we can start to uh, determine, or, or it gives us another piece of info information to determine whether we should or shouldn't treat this cancer. So uh, th there's a lot of, there are a lot of exciting uh, new research areas within prostate cancer. It's good to know. So what I'm hearing is that as, as you said previously, um, many prostate cancers are very slow growing and don't really cause problems for people. So the fact that we've got these new technologies for distinguishing the slow growing, not dangerous cancers from the more fast growing, potentially dangerous cancers is a real boon to taking care of people and giving them best care. Correct, and, correct. And maybe even reassuring for someone who's got a diagnosis uh, that, that many people don't even go on to develop a, an aggressive cancer and they live their whole life out with an unaggressive cancer that's just sitting there. Yes, and, and it, it, in fact, this is the area of greatest development. Mm -hmm. is, uh, and it's sort of the thing that we've needed all of these years is we need a crystal ball to know, well, is, is this man's cancer, uh, what, is, is it going to cause problems in yeah. 20 years? Yeah. Or is it going to not cause any problems whatsoever in 20 years? And we're with MRI, with genomics, uh, with other re with other new burgeoning area uh, research and and developments, uh, we're f we're starting to develop that crystal ball to to know what's going to happen now, five years, ten years in the future. Amazing, amazing, Dr. Stein. Thanks so much for that uh, overview of what is prostate cancer and how we diagnose it and who gets prostate cancer and how to distinguish dangerous cancers from less dangerous cancers. Um, let's talk about treatment now. And I would imagine in talking about treatment, we're talking about that smaller number of people who actually have an aggressive cancer that through the various technologies we've figured out this needs treatment. So please tell our viewers something, uh, an overview about treatment and then we can drill down into some more details about that. 
Correct. So, uh, yes, first of all, uh, again, we are, we are doing more active surveillance or watching men who uh, potentially have less aggressive cancers uh, that may, be, may not be life-limiting. Uh, but if we do find that this is a, a moderately or more aggressive prostate cancer, uh, then we do would suggest that they get the cancer treated. For now, uh, the, most, uh, all, the more common treatments are all whole gland. So we, we treat the entire prostate. We don't just go after the prostate tumors because prostate tumors are, are very difficult to identify. MRI is making it a little bit easier for us to see these tumors, but we can't be sure that there are other tumors, uh, other prostate cancer tumors in other parts uh, of the prostate that we just can't mm -hmm. see. So we, we do treat the whole entire prostate. Uh, the more common ones uh, available in America are surgery, removal of the prostate, or radiation. Uh, there are uh, a little less common uh, treatments such as cryotherapy, which is freezing of the prostate. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a, a new one that has just been introduced called HIFU, or uh, uh, high intensity uh, ultrasound, and uh -huh. that uh, involves burning of the prostate. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, so the <clears throat> there are different pluses and minuses, uh, side effects with each of these treatments. Mm -hmm. And uh, in most men, there's not really a right answer in terms of the treatment. So it's a really individual discussion with the urologist mm -hmm. as to what, um, what treatment seems to be best for that man and what his wishes and goals are mm -hmm. uh, and, and what the urologist suggests might be the best mm -hmm. option. I hear. So it sounds like there's different approaches and it's really individualized and the patient and the urologist together hopefully can have a good relationship and a good conversation to figure out what's most appropriate in that particular circumstance. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Uh, yeah, I, 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 when, I, when I talk to men, uh, it, it's a difficult discussion if there was only one good option and a lot of other not so great options, then uh, it, it would be a much more difficult discussion mm. uh, or m much, much, easier. much less difficult yeah. discussion. Yeah. Yeah, sure. uh, but, um, you know, all of these options have uh, certain benefits certain downsides so so it's it it's it, it it's not the easiest and uh yeah. it, it, it's it takes some time i understand the outcomes with prostate surgery treatment um what kind of outcomes what kind of cure rates are we looking at i imagine it depends on the stage of the cancer how far along it is how aggressive it is but perhaps you could talk a little bit about that about how successful are we in actually dealing with the prostate cancer so that it doesn't come back or it doesn't come back for a long time. Right. Um, w certainly we're not perfect in terms of treatment, in terms of curing the prostate cancer, uh, but uh, can cure rates are are quite good and it very much depends on when we find the prostate cancer, if we can find it at an earlier stage where it's less aggressive, then uh, we do have a very high likelihood of cure, uh, maybe upwards of 90 to 95 mm. percent. Mm. Uh, but with aggressive cancers that may have even already or are about to spread or metastasize, mm. uh, perhaps that the, the cure rates can go down, uh, can be only 50 to 60 percent. Mm. So it really brings back the, the importance of screening for these prostate cancers so we can catch them earlier right. when they're... When right. they're but, um, but uh, cure rates with radiation, with surgery, are quite good at this point. Right. So, so like you said, if, if it's caught early and treated early, and as you mentioned, the, the screening is the really crucial thing. Uh, we spoke before about how people often aren't symptomatic with prostate cancer. So the screening test, which typically con consists of a blood test, and if that's suspicious, then a biopsy, that's what lets you determine whether the cancer is, um, has spread or is aggressive and lets you actually find those cancers more early and more successfully treat them. Correct, correct. Great, great. So now you've been a pioneer in robotic assisted surgery and then even other kinds of surgery. So, so generally just speaking about robotic surgery, tell our viewers if you can 
what's the benefit of that? Why do we want a robot doing involved in the surgery? And what kind of added benefit did we get from that? Sure. Uh, classically, prostate surgery has involved a larger open incision uh, below the belly button uh, down to about the waistline. Mm -hmm. And um, based, d depending on the surgeon's experience, this was a, a very effective way to perform surgery. Uh, but over the years, over the last 10 to 15 years, with the development of robotics, and right now it's the Da Vinci surgical system from Intuitive, um, we, the the majority of these procedures uh, have become and, and now are uh, done robotically. Mm -hmm. And what that means is that uh, there are uh, robotic arms and instruments mm -hmm. that are placed within the patient uh, and then the surgeon controls these mm -hmm. robotic instruments. Mm -hmm. So he sits in a, in a, in a console mm -hmm. and, uh, and uh, performs all of the movements with with my hand with his uh -huh. hands you know if I'm doing it with my hands and feet uh, and the robotic instruments that are placed within the body uh, undergo the same movements uh -huh. uh, what, what this has led to is much greater surgeon comfort uh -huh. uh, we have um, a very uh, um, a, a 3D image, uh, which is very magnified, and we have very precise instruments. I see. And um, this leads to relative, uh, or I'm, I'm sorry, uh, good outcomes and results uh, at, at maybe a younger state, uh, at, at an earlier stage for uh -huh. surgeons. So uh -huh. we, we overcome the learning curve. Oh, um, interesting. And, and also there is a, a suggestion that results may be a little bit better with robotic surgery versus open surgery mm -hmm. in terms of um, getting uh, um, the uh, important functions back like mm -hmm. erections like, ah, like right. being able to hold the urine which is called continence sure. um, furthermore there's less blood loss and seemingly less complications with robotic surgery very so. interesting okay so we we covered a few different things there dr stein we talked about that the fact that uh, you spoke that uh, the robotic surgery enables a more precise surgery, surgery, so that even a less experienced surgeon can do a more precise job and get a better outcome for the robotic surgery. Um, and you also talked about the less likelihood of having complications with the surgery. So we should speak more about that in a minute because I'm sure our viewers want to know about what are the potential complications of surgery. Um, if you could also, while we're still talking about surgery, touch on the notion of the less invasive robotic surgery, because my understanding is you've also developed techniques for a single port surgery, I think you called it. Right. So if you could tell our viewers, what's the single port surgery? Okay, uh, so single port surgery is uh, a way that we've decreased the number of incisions that we need for robotic or what we, we call also laparoscopic surgery. Um, uh, typically, standardly, I make five incisions across the belly in, 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 in order to perform the robotic surgeries, uh -huh. uh, but now we've we're, we're bringing it to the point where we only need one small incision wow. in the belly button, and through that we can do the entire surgery wow. and wow. also bring the prostate out. Wow. Uh, we don't, wow. we don't, uh, Contamination. Crush. Yeah. We don't, we don't yeah. crush or, or chop the prostate into pieces. Uh -huh. We uh -huh. take the whole thing out, and but we can get that out through a very small, almost imperceptible incision in the in the belly button. Amazing, because mm -hmm. the belly button's already got sort of a you know shape to it where you can hide your incision in there, and that way the person looks like they never had surgery. Correct. Uh -huh. Yes. And uh, th this this concept has is popular enough that uh, companies, uh, in, including uh, Intuitive, are developing uh, specific technology where we can uh, uh, Im improve the robotic uh, 
platform so that we can do these single port surgeries mm -hmm. uh, you know quite easily so so this advanced surgery this single port surgery that's something that you developed at Cleveland Clinic has that technology been introduced in other centers would someone only find that in an academic center or might they find it in their community hospital and where do the surgeons get trained for that is that something that you know say a, a resident or a fellow these days would automatically be learning because it's the standard of care or please speak to our right. viewers about that yeah. so single port surgery um, we uh, we we developed it along with uh, a few other doctors in, in in a couple of different countries actually uh, but we uh, seem to uh, take it up and really do a large volume of uh, surgeries with the technology with the te with these techniques uh, but since then uh, uh, several uh, many centers in America and men and then many centers internationally certainly have uh, taken up these uh, th these different techniques just because of the interest that patients I think have sure. in having smaller and less incisions. Sure. Um, so it, it's really uh, you know an exciting area of growth and development. The problem has been that uh, the instruments that we've had aren't really specifically designed to all go through one small incision, uh -huh. and so uh, there 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 are some challenges even though we can do the surgeries well, it's not easy for a less experienced surgeon mm -hmm. to be able to do some to to be able to do something like this. Mm -hmm. So I think where we're where we've finally gotten more recently and in the very close future, we, we are going to have technology, robotic tech to technology that's specifically designed for these type of procedures. And, uh, and there's a good chance that this is going to make this uh, possible, available for all uh, urologic surgeons and, um, and, uh, and even for less experienced surgeons mm -hmm. to be able to do this very well. That's very exciting. So a question that comes up in my mind about this is when you say robotic surgery, uh, does that mean a doctor could be in Cleveland doing a surgery on a patient in Cincinnati or in Idaho? Or is it mainly just that the doctor is at the same place as the patient and using this technology to improve precision? I guess the question said otherwise would, does this allow a doctor of really high training and skill to operate where he isn't, and thus sure. spread the reach of the, 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 the new technologies. Sure. So currently, um, doctors usually are in the same location as the robot and the patient. Uh, but the, this technology was originally designed e even for battlefield med medicine, so that surgeons can be in America, and but the robotic instruments, the patient, are uh, set up in. in Iraq or another uh, war zone, mm -hmm. and so we can do uh, surgery that is uh, remote. Mm -hmm. We call it where where it's where it's far away. Mm -hmm. So I, I think with the development of uh, better. Um, uh, cables, communication cables, the internet improvements with the internet and decreases in costs with that. I think over time it, 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 it will be more possible to have the surgeon in Cleveland and the patient in, you know, another, in another location uh, so that perhaps even more uh, experienced surgeons can uh, do surgeries without the patient having to travel. Amazing, amazing. So, um, Dr. Stein, before you mentioned that uh, when, when prostate cancer screening is done properly and we catch a cancer early, that the cure rate for an aggressive cancer can be in the 90s percent somehow, which is actually very high compared to cancers in general. So that's very encouraging. Um, the question that I imagine a lot of our viewers might be wondering would, would be, okay, so suppose I have a prostate cancer that's aggressive and I need surgery. What kind of complications could I have from surgery? And I imagine it might be different for the different kinds of surgery, be it the uh, traditional surgery versus the robotic surgery versus this single port surgery that you recently developed. Can you speak to that? Sure. 
Um, so th it, it absolutely needs to be kept in mind that the, these uh, surgeries can have their downsides. Um, there's immediate issues like bleeding or infection, which are quite rare, thankfully. Uh, uh, but the, the major issues that I think people need to keep in mind are that there are sexual side effects mm. to any of these treatments, mm. be it radiation, surgery. Uh, and, and what that entails is that uh, men can lose their erection, the, their, the, the possibility of having erections. Uh -huh. uh, and, but they, they have to wait, they have to be patient, and uh, there is a good chance that they can get the erections back again uh -huh. with time. Uh -huh. uh, but uh, you might need to use something, uh, a medicine like Viagra or Cialis to help. Mm -hmm. uh, not all men will regain the ability to, uh, to get their erections back. We, we always have other options in those situations mm -hmm. uh, if it's important for that man to to re, re, to re uh, to to uh, get the erections back. Sure, sure. The other issue is uh, urinary continence. So uh, I would say most uh, men after surgery they do leak urine and they have to wear pads. Mm. Uh, maybe one pad a day, maybe a few pads a day. Mm. It's 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 impossible to predict. Mm. Uh, but once again, uh, men need to be patient and uh, almost all men regain the urinary continence again. But uh, it, it is, I think, even the more concerning uh, uh, side effect from surgery. Luckily, it's a pretty rare long-term complication. Right. So, so it sounds like what you're saying is that uh, the most typical complications that are of importance after prostate surgery would be loss of erectile function and also inability to hold their urine and some leaking. But it sounds like you're also saying that those tend to get better with time. Correct. How much time are we talking about? A week, a month, two years? Um, <laughs> all of those. Uh -huh, uh -huh, I hear. <laughs> so everyone's it, an individual. Correct. Uh -huh. Correct. So some 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 patients uh, af right after the surgery are continent. Mm -hmm. They they don't have problems. Other patients, it can take up to six months, maybe a year, to mm -hmm. regain their continence. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it steadily improves over that time, uh, but it but it can take some time. the The difficulty truly is that it, it's impossible to predict sure. Uh, sure. before the surgery. Uh, you know who's going to have the problems. By and large, uh, when I do a, a surgery, I do it. Uh, f for the most part the same way each time so I think everybody everybody's uh, body is different mm. and they mm -hmm. it re they react differently to the surgery sure, so sure. we just have to I, I I do tell men please be patient you know there is a yeah. very high likelihood that things are going to come back to right. where we want them right yeah. so you mentioned that the urinary incontinence after surgery usually comes back it can take time we don't know how long it will take correct uh, in terms of the erectile dysfunction, that's something that I think is probably on the mind of many men because they want to be able to continue to be in, active in that way. Um, is there any uh, data that show us how frequent it is that someone loses their erectile dysfunction? And if there is data about how many men actually recover it after, you know, in the months or years after the surgery? Correct. Uh, so it, 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 nothing is ever simple, yeah. unfortunately, in medicine. And yeah. so it really depends on how men's erections are coming into the surgery. Uh -huh. And as we know, as men get older, there is a higher uh -huh. chance or risk that they might already have erectile dysfunction, uh -huh. maybe to some extent already. Uh, so it, it, if uh, men come into the surgery with very good erections, and uh, we can do uh, what we call a nerve sparing surgery where we try to uh, preserve the nerves that help with the erections and just take out the prostate, then I think it's true that we can, re that we can get the erections back in up to 80% of cases. Uh -huh. So, so the, the results can be excellent even for the erections. Mm -hmm. But, but uh, at the same time, we have to be realistic. And if, uh, this, if the cancer is more aggressive and we have to uh, sacrifice some of the nerves mm -hmm. that help with the erections, or if the uh, man doesn't come in with 
perfect directions, then we have to be real more realistic that there there is a higher chance that we won't get uh, get the erections right. back mm -hmm. with time. And so it, it sounds like there's a trade off really between uh, being aggressive enough to for sure get that cancer uh, versus doing a nerve sparing surgery, which might, which might make it less likelihood that someone would lose their erectile function, but does that affect the potential surgical outcome for the cancer also? Um, it does, but that, that's our job as surgeons uh, to uh, tailor the surgery specifically for that patient. Okay. So if the patient has poor erections uh, and uh, a, a somewhat aggressive cancer, then we don't want to perform the nerve sparing surgery because mm -hmm. then it leaves him uh, more likely to have uh, uh, cancer return uh, or, or, or for us not to cure the cancer. Uh -huh. Whereas somebody with excellent erections who has uh, a less aggressive prostate cancer, we can be a little bit more aggressive about saving the nerves and, mm -hmm. and, and, and give us a much better chance of, of maintaining those erections I with see. time. Yeah, so that's where your experience and training comes in to make those distinctions. Yes, yes, yeah. all urologists. Sure, yes. sure. Dr. Stein, thank you. You've given a, a great detail about prostate cancer and its treatment and its diagnosis and treatment. Um, you're really on the cutting edge of this, so maybe you could tell our viewers what's on the horizon, because you've mentioned these are very important areas of screening and diagnosis, and then the decision-making about how to actually treat people appropriately, and then the treatments itself, and especially with your expertise in robotic surgery and other approaches to doing it better with less complications. So what's the horizon look like? So I, I think that where we're heading uh, in the future is for us to improve uh, the, all of these areas. We need to uh, be better able to, with much simpler tests, uh, tell who and who doesn't have prostate cancer. We need to figure out who has a more aggressive prostate cancer that is life-threatening and a less aggressive prostate cancer that maybe we don't need to uh, treat, maybe we don't even need to know about. I think that at, at, after that point, uh, we need better uh, treatment uh, or, or we need better decision making in sort of in terms of treatments. So it, with certain cancers, what might be a better treatment versus another treatment? Uh, and then in terms of the treatments themselves, I think that we've really moved uh, in a nice way to less invasive uh, treatments that cause less side effects. Mm. Uh, and I, I think that in the future, certainly we'll, we'll even have less invasive uh, treatments with hopefully very minimal to no side effects. Mm -hmm. And so all of those areas uh, of are, are in development and mm -hmm. we've made great strides. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's very encouraging, thank you. So Dr. Stein, you've given us a great overview of the screening diagnosis uh, treatment of prostate cancer. Um, do you have any sort of concluding words or way to summarize this whole picture to our viewers? Maybe there's someone there who is concerned they might have prostate cancer and doesn't know what to do next, or someone who's given a diagnosis of prostate cancer and also doesn't know what to do next and they're scared. Yes, yes. So uh, there, there needs to be a, a very uh, personal uh, um, relationship with the doctor, with uh, all doctors who are involved in prostate cancer care, from the primary care doctor to the urologist to maybe other doctors like radiation specialists or, or medical oncologists. So there really needs to be uh, very good discussions. Uh, there are There is a lot of information nowadays on the internet, and I think that that uh, should be taken in to a certain extent by uh, patients as well. Uh, but in, in order to really Especially refine... Especially this information, right? <laughs> correct, correct. But uh, in, in order to refine everything and to make everything specific yeah. for each person, they really need to work with the doctor and, uh, and, and have it be, instead of uh, a, a situation where the doctor tells them what to do, it has to be a shared decision-making mm -hmm. process. Mm -hmm.
there aren't always right answers or wrong answers. Right. There's right. a lot of options. Right. Wow. Okay, it's very encouraging. Dr. Robert Stein from Cleveland Clinic, who's been here discussing prostate cancer and how to deal with it and diagnose it and treat it. And uh, we really appreciate you coming and sharing your knowledge with us. So uh, thanks very much. Thank you. And Thank uh, you. <laughs> all the best. Thanks.